I want to begin with the genealogy of some definitions of hospitality and the stranger in two basic traditions, uh, the Indo-European and the Abrahamic, that could be said to comprise the main uh, influences on our Western notion of hospitality. Uh, in other seminars, I hasten to add, we will be looking at non-Western notions of hospitality, uh, but given the particular limits of this evening and my own particular limits and ac academic expertise, uh, I will be talking about the traditions that I know something about since I hear from them. Secondly, I want to say that hospitality is not going to be treated in the seminar tonight, and I think in most other seminars, as some kind of abstract virtue or concept or convention, but rather as a drama, as a drama with risks and wagers of what we're going to be calling the embodied imagination. And what we mean by that is that instead of treating the other as is often done in, in contemporary and indeed traditional philosophy, as a problem of other minds, as a metaphysical question of substances, mind-body problems, uh, cognitive science, and so on. Not that that's not a very important uh, mode of investigation, but what is perhaps specific to this seminar is the attempt to use embodied imagination and to investigate embodied imagination as a way of approaching and responding to the other. So there would be a particular focus on a pathos of hospitality, uh, which expresses the response of a self to a stranger, a sensible and carnal response that's pre-reflected and pre-conceptual, and that works through the five senses, and indeed, as we will also be exploring, a sixth sense. So on the basis of this embodied imagination, we will try to see how Hospitality involves a dual response. Uh, the mystics referred to the encounter with the stranger as fascinens et tremendum. On the one hand, it, 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 it attracts us uh, and bedazzles us. On the other hand, we recoil from it, tremendum, as Rilke signals when he says every angel is terrible. Uh, it's also a dual response in that hospitality involves both an active and a receptive openness to the other, and a certain active choice and commitment to the other. And finally, I want to suggest that embodied imagination is always, and invariably, a discerning imagination. That is that in all of the five senses, as they work through imagination, the olfactory imagination, the visual, the auditory, and so on, seeing is always a seeing as this or that, a seeing the stranger as hospitable or hostile, a hearing the stranger as hospitable or hostile, a touching the stranger as hospitable or hostile. And this, I would like to suggest, involves a sort of poetics of interpretation. I also want to suggest at the outset that there are two sort of models of hospitality in contemporary philosophy that may be useful as a guide to our readings this evening. On the one hand, there is a philosophy of conditional hospitality, which sees the relationship of self to stranger as relational. On the other hand, there is a model of unconditional or absolute hospitality, represented largely by Derrida. The first I would suggest is represented by Ricoeur and Hermeneutic. Uh, the second by Derrida and the deconstructive uh, school. And here we get a very different notion of hospitality as an openness to the radical other without preconditions. So let me say a few words about each of those before proceeding to a, genealog a brief uh, genealogical account of the Indo-European and Abrahamic uh, notions of hospitality. The guest box and the guest book, again, has to situate the participant in the world and reaffirm the paradox of the wager, in this case of, of Richard's original wager, which is the wager of the host and the stranger. It has to present a call to exploration and learning and expression. That is, if you want somebody to sign a book, 
you have to somehow invite them to do that, and it has to be meaningful at the end. They have to feel that it's meaningful. Um, I don't know if we can push it far enough, so there's that sort of comic response that you talk about, which has to do with the fear of accepting the wager, of being the friend, of, of becoming the friend. Um, uh, and then we have to deal with this mul multicultural issue. It has to be robust and easy to set up, and it has to act as a memory vessel. And the memory vessel, I think, is, is a beautiful thing because when all of these recordings happen and all of the beautiful uh, work that are starting off each lecture, how do we display that in a way that somebody can, can understand or row with who comes to a performance that is outside of the, the weekly meetings? And um, as you could see from the film of The Wheel, this is not easy. So I would like to begin tonight with uh, a story. It's the paradigmatic story of hospitality that virtually every child in India is familiar with. It is the story of Krishna and Sudama, also known as Kuchela, which is a surname or an epithet. And, and it is told in the Bhagavata Purana, Book 10, Cantos 80 to 81. It's a surprisingly simple story, enigmatic in its lack of didacticism and moral allegorization. It goes like this. Sudama, or Kuchera, is learned, but he's an impoverished Brahmin. His good and long-suffering wife suggests that he, that he visit his old school friend Krishna, who is now the king of Dwaraka, and married to Rukmini, known as the incarnation of Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. Sudama agrees and takes a heap of puffed rice borrowed from a neighbor as a gift for Krishna. Sudama arrives at Krishna's glittering palace, and surprisingly, no one bars his way. When Krishna sees Sudama, he embraces him warmly, reminisces about their school days, and eagerly partakes of the puffed rice that Sudama is now too ashamed to offer. When Sudama returns to his village, he finds that his humble hut has been transformed into a luxurious palace and that he and his family have been provided with every material necessity. The text says he was liberated from labor. Sudama dedicates his life to living happily, teaching, practicing austerity and humility, and eventually attains salvation. It was not until I was reminded of other meaning contexts, such as the tale of the poor fisherman and his greedy wife, you know the folk tale? I'm sure many of you are aware of that, yeah? Um, or the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, right? That I discovered the strangeness of this tale. How should one understand the story, which seems uncritical of the complaining wife, the luxury of the rich, and even equates reward with material wealth? Let us try again by contemplating the story as it unfolds. This time, I shall call the story Eating the Nothing. Arendt doesn't acknowledge, though, in that, in, in, in that um, view, that this state of living corpse um, wasn't invented by the Nazis. Um, you can find it in the tradition, um, for example. This is from Peter the Venerable. I, I find that extraordinary. He's called Peter the Venerable when you hear what he said. Um, this is in a letter he wrote to Louis VI in 1146. If the Saracens are to be detested, how much more are the Jews to be execrated and hated, who utterly insensible to Christ and the Christian faith reject, blaspheme, and ridicule that virgin birth and all the sacraments of human redemption? Nor do I say this to incite the royal or Christian sword to slay their wickedness. God wishes them not to be killed, but to be preserved in a life worse than death, like, like Cain the fratricide, for greater torment and greater ignominy. 
One thing that I, I wanted to begin with was this notion of scapegoat, other, outsider, outcast, uh, and hospitality or hostility uh, is certainly the notion uh, of working with when we began in, uh, these burn uh, stories and, and uh, studying these things. Uh, it was a real issue uh, when these people were noted as burn victims and, in fact, um, my husband and I made a very strong point of saying they're not victims, they're survivors. It's part of what you mentioned, too, because they really are ghosts. Uh, they have survived hell, and we shun them in a way because it's too painful for us to think that they're before the grace of God or. Um, and so uh, all of those ideas uh, come together with this notion of the hospitality, the hostility, and um, I thought very much back to the first week with the, the uh, paintings we, uh, we saw, uh, the notion of the welcome guest more than the unwelcome guest. Uh, and I think that what our topic is this evening really addresses most painfully with those uh, uh, comments, uh, the, the, the identification of the outsider, the Jew, um, really addresses the, the dilemma that we have of the unwelcome guest because more often than not, as you were saying so rightly, the Jehovah's Witnesses at the door, please let me be anywhere else but near. Uh, the entrance way. And so uh, the unwelcome guest, I think, is something we have a more difficult time reconciling. In other words, the constitution of meaning requires us to pair the sensed with words. Meaning is constituted in the, in the form of a phrase that has the basic form of, I take this to be that. We may immediately ask whether such a claim or even the very existence of words themselves do not already in indicate a profound intersubjectivity. Language is already dialogue, even if sometimes in the diminished form of dialogue with oneself. This marks it for humiliation and for grandeur. And I am almost done. If language, and indeed meaning itself, is an endless dialogue, then it is prevented, we are prevented, from ever settling into the power of an unquestionable assertion, there can always come another question, or there has always already been a first request. There's been a lot of interesting research on prejudice and stereotyping, and it's been shown that even by five months, this has set in. Um, Liz Belke, who's, who's at Harvard, a developmental psychologist, has shown that five-month-olds prefer speakers of their own language to speakers of another language. And remember, they can't understand language yet, but they will prefer speakers who sound familiar to them. And it's even the same finding for dialects. They prefer people who speak in their own dialect versus other dialects. 12-month-olds, one-year-olds, distrust new people who are not like them. Again, it's from Spelke's lab. She exposes kids to two strangers. One stranger speaks their parents' language. One speaks a foreign language. And then children are offered food by both of them. And which one do they go for? They go for the food that's offered by the person who speaks their parents' language. According to Gerson, the, the state of prayer is extremely subtle. His descriptions are absolutely marvelous. They're very close to Levinas's, what, what Jeff was reading to us last week about community is prior to solitude, etc. cetera. Um, and in particular, according to Gerson, this is the stage, I sort of wanted to, to, to read from it, the stage where really the, the the self gives up even its own will to God. So what then is the sixth sense? Through most of Gerson, it is synderesis, the highest part of the soul, higher than pure intelligence. And Gerson cites Augustine, who describes saint Thérèse as the soul's weight in his very famous Augustinian statement, pondus meum amor meus. But then I would submit to you we have a problem because if Sinderesis is the soul's inclination to seek God and thus the soul's sense of its own exile, 
Sandhiraz must in some sense vanish or be transformed in the ecstatic union with God. Gerson says when the soul is purified, illuminated, and tested, nothing prevents it from being transported by love to the one who is wholly desirable and loving and, and lovable. When the soul is conjoined and united with God, Gerson says, quote, it embraces its supreme good, its center, its destination and perfection. What else could it possibly need? What else could it desire? A mon seul désir. Now, many quaint legends also rose in the Middle Ages about sightings of this strange creature at the extreme frontiers of the Western world. Uh, wherever Westerners went, north, south, east, or west, they very often came back with sightings of the unicorn. Travelers, adventurers, crusaders, Marco Polo amongst them. And there were even practices of circulating unicorns' horns taken usually from the tusk of the walrus, whose ground powder was then considered to have magical and <coughs> mystical healing powers. And as Anne mentioned, when the unicorn um, in legend frequented rivers and dipped its horn into the rivers and waters, it was seen as an act of cleansing, of undoing the poison. And very often medicine, as you know, the snake and the unicorn have this in common, that they are creatures who are very often demonized and despised and marginalized and scapegoated, but they have the source of healing and wisdom. You find that, obviously, in, in the biblical you know, mosaic story of raising the, the, the scepter of the, of the serpent to cure the, the Israelites from the, the poisonous bite of the serpents. And you find the same thing in the Asclepian um, Greek symbol of, you have it to this day, you know, the chemist, the pharmacy, as the, the scepter with the, with the snake wrapped around. Okay. Well, good evening. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to speak for a few minutes. Uh, about uh, these two thinkers, Jacques Derrida and Bernard Waldenfels, uh, I know many of you attended uh, Professor Waldenfels's lecture last week, and I will be speaking from the material in his lecture, as well as from Derrida's book, uh, Translated of Hospitality, one of his later writings. Now, just to begin, uh, we're interested in these two thinkers because uh, they are interested in a very specific, very deep way in this event of hospitality. They're interested in this moment at the doorstep of our ident identities uh, where <clears throat> the arrival of the stranger, the guest, perhaps the enemy, will upset the balance of our egocentric existence. Now, their, their goal is not to fetishize the other, but because this event, this, this interruption, housed in the layers of everyday gestures and handshakes and greetings and the openings of doors, because this, this event, whether it's explicit or subtle, is so pregnant uh, with provocative possibilities, uh, they're interested in it. They're interested in looking at it as a summons to our fundamental being, to our fundamental personhood. Strange indeed is the encounter with the other, whom we perceive by means of sight, hearing, smell, but do not frame within our consciousness. Risteva writes, Confronting the foreigner whom I reject and with whom at the same time I identify, I lose my boundaries. I no longer have a container. The memory of experiences then abandoned overwhelm me. I lose my composure. I feel lost, indistinct, hazy. It is in this sense that the foreigner is a symptom that we cannot repress. The uncanny strangeness points to the difficulty I have in situating myself with respect to the other. Paul Ricoeur reads the Tower of Babel story found in the book of Genesis as a compelling mythical illustration of the plurality of human existence. He insists that although the story is usually, uh, usually read as an account of divine punishment, there is in fact no recrimination or even moral evaluation by God 
as he scatters the nations and confounds the tongues. Ricoeur understands this account, as he does the original fall account, as a description of the human condition and not as a record of retribution by an angry and jealous God. As an illustration of linguistic plurality, this story serves to remind us that our only option, if we hope to relate to our linguistic other, is to translate. That is, that we are plural, that we are born into different tongues and different ways of being, and that we are scattered across the earth means that any intercourse with others will require translation. Of course, this translation can take different shapes, can be coercive and imperialistic, can disregard the distinctiveness of the foreigner and her language, or welcoming and hospitable, can open itself to the other without reducing the other to itself. The latter option, which recur terms linguistic hospitality, is the more difficult task in that it requires of the translator a, quote, work of mourning, a letting go of the supremacy of one's own language and of oneself as autonomous arbiter of truth and meaning, and a finding of oneself as one among others, as a foreigner or stranger dwelling among other foreigners and strangers. Then, as it happens, the word for guardian spirit, or for what he, guardian spirit with deer, is kilianaginap. When I first read that, kilianaginap, I decided the Irish slave is going to be called Killian because that worked for me in this scene. The little boy says, Killian Aginap, or he hears Killian say, Killian, my name's Killian. He says, Killian Aginap, and then Killian says, Killian. And so that's another, he, there's another way that there's a bridge made between the guest <laughs> and the host, if you will, in this particular situation. Um, and then, the, you know, Killian, the older uh, person, experienced person, tries to initiate making contact. Uh, and while Pamela focused specifically on the context of this philosophical dispute um, uh, about Aristotle uh, among theologians um, and university faculty members in the university in the early 13th century, in which um, the question is really how to appropriately appropriate the texts and traditions of pagan philosophers, um, there's, there's a larger context in which I would also like to situate this, uh, which is evoked by the verbal and visual um, uh, uh, text that we've been seeing of the church fathers, Jerome and Augustine, the, the defense of the sacraments, and especially the Eucharist represented in the image that we, we saw, as well as the, the whole context of the Bible moralisé as a whole. And this points to another textual dispute, obviously, the Bible in Jewish and Christian traditions. Whose sacred scripture is it? Who has the right to translate and gloss it? What kinds of move from text to meaning, from letter to figure, are authorized? Speaking metaphorically, then, the Bible is a site par excellence to demonstrate Derrida's laws of hospitality, the, the place where the host, the Hebrew Bible, becomes the hostage the Old Testament now, as fulfilled by the New, the, the, the place taken over by the guest who supersedes, an important word, the former host, is this a hostile takeover, while keeping it present as testimony to its own truth. Who can you trust? Who is telling the truth? In a plurality of ideologies and religions, <coughs> Who can you believe will save you? This question haunts political and social acts as much as it does the religious. It's certainly central to the gesture of welcome and to any threshold experience. Whose speech is authentic speech? As it turns out, the possessed nuns of Lud in Ludun did not believe their exorcists, priests they already knew, enough to be saved by them. Instead, they laughed at their rituals and refused to be healed. This example of a failure of words to persuade and save was one that sig signaled the end of a social contract. Such a contract ended in the 20th century, too. It was a different one, an outcome of war, mass murder, and brutal ide ideology, but it has been signaled by a failure to believe in shared values and spoken words. In an ideal society, hosts and guests would be interchangeable, so there would be no need to name one, one or the other. 
In ancient images of grieving, as we've just seen, you see that the host and guest are engaged in a single dance that could not be performed alone. The bowing, the hands extended, the leaning heads. The dance of friendship is egalitarian and pliable. Respect is mutual. But above all, each body is free to come and go at will. Why is welcome then such a loaded subject? In his story, Guests of the Nation, the Irish writer, Frank O'Connor, wrote about British prisoners of war under the IRA who are welcomed into captivity, who become friends of the guards, and then are taken out and shot by their hosts. A more recent version of this horror came up in the movie The Crying Game. Both explore the way a welcome can signify capture and selection. In both, the invisible force of love hovers over all the characters' choices, but it's helpless to intervene. It turns out that complete freedom is required for a guest to be a guest, because he or she must be able to leave in order to continue being a guest rather than a hostage, possessed. And the one whom God invites in, into his wounds, into his Godhead. My dove in the cleft of the rocks, in the crannies of the wall, show me your face, let your voice sound in my ears. Song of Songs 214. Bernard of Clairvaux. How joyously she explores the crannies, the many and varied resting places and mansions which are in her father's house, in which he lodges his children according to the deserts of each. And indeed, she does the only thing she can for now, and rests there in memory, entering in imagination into the heavenly home which is above. In the 61st sermon of his song, Sermons on the Song of Songs, the clefts in the rock are Christ's wounds and a place of refuge for the soul. And really, where is there safe rest for the weak except in the Savior's wounds? There, the security of my dwelling depends on the greatness of his saving power. From the wounds, Bernard writes, I can suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty stone. I can taste and see that the Lord is good. Through the clefts in Christ's body, the secret of his heart is laid open, the mighty mystery of loving is laid open, laid open to the tender mercies of our God, in which the morning sun from on high has risen upon us. Surely his heart is laid open through his wounds. In this sense, Birth of a Nation was a perfect reminder for 1915 audiences who were witnessing daily progressive era revolutionary efforts by other subject, uh, subjugated groups, new strangers, who were once again threatening the restored racial and gendered order. Women desired an escape from the rigid confines of the private home and a greater social role within the newly developing public space. Immigrants were coming to America to partake of its manufacturing promise. The working class was seeking strength in numbers, uniting against the tyrannical ownership. African Americans and Native Americans continued to push for greater equality as citizens. Historian Stephen J. Diner writes, quote, people competed continually and sometimes violently to gain advantage or maintain the status quo as institutions changed. With Birth of a Nation, then, Griffith linked 20th century urbanization, women's suffrage, workers' strikes, civil rights, and ethnic infusion to a fabricated collective memory of the Civil War and Reconstruction. These new strangers were reminded that as it was before, so it shall be again. As you attempt to break from your assigned positions within the American social group, the host white heroes will again emerge to guide the human race to the light of advanced civilization. In this sense, D.W. Griffith's visual masterpiece of propaganda would be the opening ideological salvo in a real world battle to again restore the white male to his position of authority. So if there were to be a title for my comments today, it would be Still Strange Fruit, Images of Black Women in the Media. Why Still Strange Fruit? How many people have heard the song Strange Fruit? It's a Billie Holiday song, and it's about um, lynching in the US, um, in the South. And the, the, the song starts out and she says, southern trees bear a strange fruit. And she's referring to the image of, lit the literal image of African Americans hanging from the trees in the South. And so this image of strange fruit 
is one that um, is really has been referenced um, often in African American literature and culture and music. And um, so when you so when you hear strange fruit, it's the literal body that's being referred to, the literal black body that is being lynched, that's being referred to. And um, I chose to I I was thinking about this in relation to black women and this idea of strangeness and the idea of um, despite some of the progress that has been made in relation to these image images, um, despite some of the progress that has been made and a lot of the backlash that um, birth, films like Birth of a Nation received, that today in a contemporary context, in some ways, black women really are still strange fruit. And the political relationship between the U.S. and China changes dramatically, and the stereotypical image of Chinese people changes as well. Americans enter into what uh, Isaacs called the age of hostility. Um, and if you look at that other image there on that page, it says figure 12, um, men without women, women without men, children without parents. Uh, this was published in Newsweek in 1958. Uh, and suddenly that familial discourse, that familial system of representation breaks down. Chinese people are represented in the media as severing familial ties among themselves as they're each segregated into their own uh, sort of sex-defined social roles. Uh, and presented as destroying uh, the individual, becoming a mass of indistinguishable uh, and interchangeable robots who are barely human at all. Uh, communist Chinese and their Mao suits are often described in the, in the American media as blue-suited ants, a kind of vision of a terrifying um, mass entity that, that, has no, uh, that has neither individual uh, identity nor a kind of family uh, subunits. Um, and after China's successful assault against U.S. forces in the Korean War, this image becomes stronger and more prominent. There's lots of talks, uh, talk of the human wave uh, that just keeps on coming. The mass of soldiers is so vast that individual deaths don't matter, this kind of thing. So war and conflict bring with them, as we know, and we've seen some of the images of the past, death, destruction, mutilation, rape and above all, trauma. So both the perpetrators and the victims bear the same scars, some more radically than others, and some will never take, uh, a mo uh, will ever have that ability to be healed. And our attempt in these conflict resolution films is to show how the healing process can at least begin. And we've seen that there are great scars of guilt, humiliation, uh, and uh, above all, alienation from community. So what we've done in our conflict resolution film since 1997, when we first went to Northern Ireland, we've attempted to do quite an extensive uh, period of research and using especially Ray Helmick's you know, knowledge of each of these conflict areas. We would enter into the situation, get someone on the ground to assist us, film, for usually two, three, four weeks if necessary, and then come back, write a script, working everything through, and present what I think is very important that I've learned from Ray myself, the dual narrative, two individuals in a conflict, each having their own valid histories at times, and bringing them to the fore and trying to reconcile in the best way possible. So we have tried to use that model through the seven conflict resolution films. My own experience in the place was just asking Pari, had he ever drawn this conclusion, that the peace initiatives in Northern Ireland had come most directly from the militants, the people who had been most directly involved in the fighting, are the ones who understood best how necessary it was to get out of that. I'd had that experience in talking with them from very early in the con conflict back in 1972. And Eventually, the decisions about such things as the ceasefire, the opening of negotiations, had, had to be decided by the paramilitary leaderships, both IRA and UDA and UVF. And the thinking for it was done so largely in the prison. This is something I'd become very familiar with because over a period of years, I had gone into the prison quite regularly to hold conversations with the prisoners in the H blocks. I'd had an experience earlier of being a mediator for about six weeks of the hunger strike in 1981. And I knew that from the prisoners, we were going to get 
probably the best view of what was really at stake in the conflict, and that they came to the conclusion that neither of their communities really had a future in Northern Ireland unless they learned how to accommodate each other. That sounds like a very low stage of reconciliation, but it was the essential thing that unless they could construct an Ireland, Ireland in which the other could live and be very much at home, there was not going to be a life for either side in that conflict. I had a mantra when I would hold these meetings in the H blocks that what was really needed from them was that they become the guarantors of one another's difference. What I would call the, uh, the narcissism of small differences. Uh, and my, maybe my, the, my favorite example of this is in, is in Northern Ireland, where the loyalists that you heard and the members of the IRA that you heard came from the poorest communities in Northern Ireland. I mean, the Shankill Road, identified with Protestant militarism, and the Falls Road, identified with uh, Republican militarism, are both parallel to each other. And yet, for, for decades, perhaps forever, uh, one group had never crossed over into the other. Now, I want to read it and then say something about just one aspect of it, which I think is important to this occasion and perhaps to this venue. Of course, I've chosen Eliot because he's the greatest Anglo-Catholic poet that we've got, uh, and <coughs> those of us who are English believe that Anglo-Catholicism has its merits. The religion is not mine, I hasten to I read Eliot as somebody with whom I am pro in profoundly unsympathetic when it comes to uh, Christianity in general and his Christianity in particular. Uh, but we have literature, as William Manson says, to give us sympathetic access to systems of belief that are not our own. And there are only two ways in which we ever get that, and one is quite through people that we are fond of, our family and our friends, and the other is through works of art. This is how you get sympathetic access, access to systems of belief that are not your own. Uh, my oldest child, who's 50, uh, when I asked him about um, the village in which he lives uh, with his wife in England, I said, has the vicar called on you? So David, who is a severe figure, said to me, no, but since the subject has come up, I ought perhaps to tell you that I have been received into the Church of England. <laughs> Judge of my astonishment, I've given him a perfectly healthy upbringing. <laughs> 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 so I extended my hand, shook him by the hand, and I have access to a system of belief that is not my own. But this is one of the two ways in which we do it. It's through works of art. Uh, and it's one of the sad things about recent times. The works of art have been increasingly valued for our concurring with them. That is, something is a great work of art if it shares your convictions and realizes them very well for you. Now, that's one way in which works of art are great, but they're also great in exactly the opposite way. I mean, I admire, within limits, Hopkins. Um, uh, yeah, and, but because it's an extraneous demonstration of a view of the world that I can't imagine myself holding. Um, do, do you see what I'm wanting to get at uh, in this? So I'll read, I'll read the Dantes passage. What we all know is that it combines Brunetto Latini who is in the Inferno, uh, with Arno Daniel, who is in Purgatory. And the question I want to attend to briefly after reading it is, at what point does that transition happen, and what exactly is going on when Elliot does this? In the uncertain hour before the morning, near the ending of interminable night, at the recurrent end of the unending, after the dark dove with the flickering tongue had passed below the horizon of his homing, while the dead leaves still rattled on like tin over the asphalt where no other sound was. Between three districts whence the smoke arose, I met one walking, loitering and hurried, as if blown towards me like the metal leaves before the urban dawn wind unresisting. And as I fixed upon the downturned face that pointed scrutiny with which we challenged the first met stranger in the waning dusk, I caught the sudden look of some dead master, whom I had known, forgotten, half recalled, both one and many. In the brown baked features, the eyes of a familiar compound ghost, both intimate and unidentifiable. So I assumed a double part and cried and heard another's voice cry, what are you here 
although we were not. I was still the same, knowing myself, yet being someone other, and he a face still forming, yet the words sufficed to compel the recognition they preceded. And so, compliant to the common wind, too strange to each other for misunderstanding, in concord at this intersection time of meeting nowhere, no before and after, we trod the pavement in a dead patrol. I said, the wonder that I feel is easy, yet ease is cause of wonder. Therefore speak, I may not comprehend, may not remember. And he, I am not eager to rehearse my thought and theory which you have forgotten. These things have served their purpose, let them be. So with your own, and pray they be forgiven by others, as I pray you to forgive both bad and good. Last season's fruit is eaten, and the full-fed beast shall kick the empty nail. For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. But as the passage now presents no hindrance to the spirit unappeased and peregrine between two worlds become much like each other, so I find words I never thought to speak in streets I never thought I should revisit when I left my body on a distant shore. Since our concern was speech, and speech impelled us to purify the dialect of the tribe and urge the mind to aftersight and foresight, let me disclose the gifts reserved for age to set a crown from your life and ever. First, the cold friction of expiring sense without enchantment, offering no promise but bitter tastelessness of shadow fruit as body and soul begin to fall asunder. Second, the conscious impotence of rage at human folly and the laceration of laughter at what ceases to amuse. And last, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been, the shame of motives late revealed and the awareness of things ill done and done to others' harm which once you took for exercise of virtue. Then fool's approval stings and honour stings. From wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds, and is restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure, like a dancer. The day was breaking. In the disfigured street, he left me with a kind of valediction and faded on the blowing of the horn. Ah. We years are mere winks into eternity, as the prophet Hart Crane sang. There in his bleak cell-like room in the third story of the makeshift school off St. Stephen's Green, parrying with the other, the stranger, Jacob's angel, or something far more terrifying. Not, I'll not carry in comfort despair, not feast on thee, not on twist slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can. Can something, hope, wish they come, not choose not to be. But ah, but, O oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me thy ring world right foot rock? Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, O oh, in turns of tempest, me heat there, me frantic to avoid thee, and flee. Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear. Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since seems I kiss the rod, hand rather, my heart low, lot strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with. My God! My God! A cat and mouse game, then something in the priest rebelling with that rebel will of his against whom? The enemy? The stranger? The friend? His own dark doppelganger? The crucified Christ, hanging by his mangled hands from the rugged crossbeam? Coming out of the darkness of the long night to catch himself likewise nailed and broken? Uttering the opening line of the 42nd Psalm, the Eli, Eli, Lebe, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uttered now first as a swearing cry of pain, and then as a sign of utter amazement, the words chiming perfectly with his masters in this reenactment of the crucified self. <laughs> 
throughout history, uh, our history and the history of others, it's been quite common to find that a very forthcoming uh, hospital stance, uh, in fact, masks something quite different. So let me think about, ask you to think about a few examples, which are deeply embedded in our own, in our own history and our own culture, uh, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, actually, a good place to start is with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, in the 1620s, 380 years ago. Uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, as maybe you know, had a great seal. Uh, the great seal of the colony uh, uh, shows uh, an Indian with his naked Indian spears pointed down, sign of peace, and a scroll coming out of his mouth, uh, presumably because he couldn't talk English, uh, saying, come over and help us. Okay, that's Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, so the colonists then were responding to the plea of uh, the natives to be uh, rescued from their bitter uh, pagan uh, fate. And the colonists were showing the indigenous population the uh, noblest form of hospitality. We're coming here at your request to uh, uh, rescue you. Uh, this is probably the first example of what's nowadays called humanitarian intervention. We respond to the pleas of people to come and rescue them. And that's the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, <coughs> like uh, many of its successors, uh, as history has shown, uh, it turned out to be something a little different. Uh, and those consequences were not at all obscured to the agents. So for example, the first Secretary of War uh, General Henry Knox <coughs> described the utter extirpation of all the Indians in the most popular, populous parts of the Union, starting right here, uh, by means more destructive to the Indian natives than the conduct of the conquerors of Mexico and Peru, which was horrible enough. Uh, some years later, uh, John Quincy Adams, actually long after his own disgraceful role in these activities was over, uh, uh, described uh, uh, that he lamented the fate of what he called that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating with such merciless and perfidious cruelty, uh, something which went on after his lament and left very little there. And others, too, were no less aware of what they were doing as they answered the plea of the uh, Natives to come over here and help us. Uh, there is a more acceptable interpretation, and that's the one that's come down in history in one or another form. Uh, according to this version, uh, by the mysterious will of, mostly quoting, by the mysterious will of divine providence, the Indians just melted away like the snow in springtime as they were replaced in a natural way by a superior race. The colonists were blameless. Uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Joseph Story explained in 1828 that the colonists constantly respected Indians, but to the dismay of their Puritan benefactors, everywhere at the approach of the white man, the Indians fade away. We hear the rustling of their footsteps like that of the withered leaves of autumn, and they are gone forever. And we are left to ponder the wisdom of providence and to sigh at the constant sacrifices of this bold but uh, wasting race. C. Wright Mills, in the book The Sociological Imagination, 1959, calls for a mixture of you know, critical biographical analysis and our social structural position history, that place between. He said it isn't enough just to get factual information about that place. We need a new sensibility that will allow us without guilt to reckon with the consequences of the enormous violence that we should take be accountable for, begin to be responsible for. Now, how do we do that without just feeling guilt, without feeling paranoia? I mean, this is something I think that is the challenge for us uh, out of this whole seminar series, perhaps. Uh, how do we begin uh, to give hospitality? First, I think we have to deal with the hostilities that have been our own. Um, and those are difficult things to reckon with. Uh, um, I think we're going to have to sacrifice some of our privileges, certainly sacrifice some of what we think of as our just uh, cleaned up self-image, uh, uh, change that image. Uh, 
Um, the work I, I usually advocate in this regard is something like a power reflexive uh, form of engagement uh, uh, with these hauntings. Uh, a power reflexivity deals with resonances as well as facts. Uh, um, that really, in some sense, is about an embodied, uh, uh, taking seriously emotion and embodiment, uh, taking seriously sacrifices and hauntings uh, uh, that bring us to a crossroads where, in some sense, uh, um, you know, we're asked, uh, uh, again, literally, uh, to reckon with uh, uh, that which we've done uh, before we can reconcile with uh, others who we have, in some sense, pushed to the outside. Uh, this sometimes happens at the very edge of semiotic uh, availability, uh, things that we don't have good words for, we don't have clean lessons or good programs for, because we have a whole history of just doing the opposite, of denying, uh, repressing, and keeping away. Reckoning, Gordon writes, is about knowing what kind of effort becomes required uh, to make the conditions we're in different, uh, um, how to attend to what is acceptable as well as unacceptable, but not just to notice limits, but begin to do what she calls uh, the work of uh, uh, Walter Benjamin, the profane illumination, uh, to spark up uh, with some courage, to spark up what's on the outside of us uh, uh, that we engage it. Uh, uh, in my own teaching is, is to teach things like what Noam Chomsky is doing, I know I've used his book, so to teach the facts of history, but also ask the students to engage in a project of disautobiography. Not tell their own story, but tell the story you can't tell unless you reckon with structures of power that usually are kept away from us. So how to do disautobiographical analysis. Uh, also, of course, as a sociology, ask students to you know, be in contact uh, uh, with cultures, practices, social classes that otherwise they wouldn't be in contact with here at Chestnut Hill. Um, so how to have contact with those who have been othered uh, and how to have methods that are attentive in some sense to not only what the cognitive but the emotional elements of knowledge that might come from this. Um, we one could uh, find uh, many passages um, in the Koran, um, the sacred book of Islam, and um, in the uh, uh, prophetic um, traditions that elevates um, this virtue of kindness and generosity um, towards um, strangers um, to a matter of um, religious um, duty. Uh, and I think anyone who has um, lived or worked um, in the Middle East um, could certainly attest um, to the great emphasis um, that is placed on, the, on these values um, at all levels of, um, of society. Uh, in the Iranian culture, with which I'm um, more familiar, um, in particular, the theme of hospitality um, to strangers is uh, quite uh, paramount. Uh, in fact, so much so that at times um, it could become almost um, overbearing. Um, to give you uh, but one example, um, albeit an unfortunate and, uh, and a somewhat surrealistic one, I want to describe for you um, the uh, encounter between one group of uh, Americans and their um, Iranian hosts uh, some uh, three decades ago. Um, one detail in this story, which makes it a bit different from the usual um, accounts of um, hospitality uh, to strangers um, is the fact that the group of Americans that uh, I have in mind um, was not uh, there voluntarily as guests um, of their Iranian hosts. Uh, but obviously, uh, I'm referring, uh, by now you should have guessed, to the most unfortunate encounter between these two cultures um, in recent times, namely um, the takeover of the uh, um, United States Embassy in Tehran uh, back in November of um, 1979. 